participating during the discussion, we ask that you keep yourself on mute so that everyone will be able to hear what is being discussed. Um, please feel free to join in the discussion and drop any of your questions and some comments in the chat. Um, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a chat button that you can click on um, so that our panelists can address your questions. Also, if you want to keep your video off, that is completely up to you. This is for privacy reasons. And also in the chat where it says two, you can do to everyone if you want everyone to see it. And if you want it to be a personal, you can go to the host, which would say Psi Iota Omega, and our host can keep your questions and answer them later. So let's engage in the first question. All right. What has been most stressful during this pandemic? And this is for our audience. What has been most stressful during this pandemic? And now this goes inside the chat and we'll look at it right after. Without further ado, I would like to introduce each of our panelists. And I want you guys to also say your name, your expertise and why you went into mental health. Our first on the screen is Ms. Claudia Kidd. Hi, good evening. As um, Charlene said, my name is Claudia Kidd, and I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I currently practice with an organization called named Crosspoint Clinical Services, which provides um, Christian counseling. And my office is in Stoughton, but like everyone else around the country, I'm practicing um, across telehealth right now. So why did I go into mental health? I think as a young girl, I just didn't have the resources around me to talk to someone. And I always valued and always wanted to have someone to talk to. And I wanted to make sure that I was that for someone else. I think I've been given a great talent in being able to listen and to, to, um, to really hear hard things from people and not pull away. So I, I've really dedicated myself to using that talent, and I'm looking forward to the panel tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Claudia. Next, our panel, Dr. Trinice Lewis-Harris. So good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Trinice Lewis-Harris, and I am a psychologist and assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. I am primarily working as the director of child outpatient training at the Cambridge Health Alliance. And in the Brockton area, I am a psychologist at Westside Behavioral Health. My specialties include multicultural mental health, Christian counseling, and child and adolescent psychotherapy. And I went into the psychology field uh, similar to Claudia uh, because I really uh, wanted to provide uh, a person that someone can talked to, and I was just aware of many family and friends who were going through a lot as I was growing up and uh, wanted to provide spaces where people could have private conversations. Thank you, Dr. Trinise. Next. Ms. Elise Ingerman. Hi. Um, I'm Elise Ingerman. I'm a licensed mental health counselor and a licensed alcohol and drug counselor in the state of Massachusetts. I'm currently a substance abuse counselor at BMZ, and I am currently also a private practice owner of Myself Oak Inc. in Brockton, Massachusetts. Um, my specialty is obviously substance use, but um, I also specialize in anxiety, depression, PTSD, et cetera. I'm duly licensed, so deal with a lot of dual diagnosis or um, somebody who suffers from a substance abuse disorder as well as a mental health disorder. Um, the reason why I went into this field, oh, um, so when I was 16, I lost my best friend and um, my mom actually had me see my school counselor and I was literally seeing her up until I went to college. And I said to myself, I wanted to be that for somebody else. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Elise. Next, we have Ms. Guan Ellery. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, again, my name is Guan Ellerby. I'm a licensed mental health counselor as well in the state of Massachusetts. Um, I created a private practice called Leading Light Behavioral Health here in Brockton. Um, as long with um, having a license in mental health counseling, I also have a license in social work. 
I have a background in working for DCF for two and a half years. Um, I'm an adjunct professor at Eastern Nazarene College um, in the adult graduate studies program as well as a part-time clinician for Talkspace, amongst a lot of other things that I like to do, I enjoy doing. The reason for me coming into the field, um, I would have to say it was due to my upbringing, where I was brought up. I, and growing up in the 80s, um, there was a lot of trauma, um, substance use, um, HIV was running rampant, and it hit my family very, very hard. And with that, um, I noticed that there were social workers close to my home where I grew up in Mission Hill Projects um, in, Br in the Brigham Circle area who was helping my family out tremendously. And I always said, I want to do what those people are doing. I didn't pity the family, but I really looked at what the social workers were bringing to my family and I valued them and wanted to be just like them. So that's what brought me to the field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan. Thank you. So we do have to, we're going to go right into this and we're going to dive right in. We have a question for all of our panelists. We all know that mental health and wellness in communities of color, especially the black community, can sometimes carry a stigma. There is sometimes judgment for asking for help, right? So can our panelists share some of their thoughts or experiences about this perception? <clears throat> Well, the, the stigma has really been part of our community in part due to the strengths that we have. Our community has been known for being quite resilient through years of slavery, through the Jim Crow era, through racism, and we wear it as a badge of honor, but sometimes it works against us when we're feeling down or really anxious. There's a part of us that will often say, well, if we could get through slavery, why can't we get through this? Or if we have a spirituality in our lives, we often think, well, why can't I just depend on, you know, my God? Why am I feeling anxious about that? So there are ways that we really kind of hold ourselves to a higher standard because of the history of trauma that our people have been through. Thank you, Dr. Trinise. Also, um, sorry, Elise. Um, like how I was brought up, my mom is on the call, so mommy don't yell at me or text me and, and raunchy. Um, <laughs> what happens in this house stays in this house. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, we never discussed anything. And thank God my mom put me into therapy when my best friend passed. But outside of that, when things were happening within the family and all that, nothing leaves outside of this house. You can't go to school and talk about it. You can't go in the neighborhood and talk about it. So with you having that mindset, I ain't telling no, nobody nothing. Yeah, true. That I, would, I would agree with that. And um, my upbringing is from the islands. And I always say that it was not something that was a part of, a, culturally was a part of um, my upbringing. Uh, mental health wasn't something that you talked about. It wasn't an issue. And I think we um, relied on just our, our own inner strength, like um, Trinice was saying, and Dr. Dr. Um, Harris was saying, is that it was just not something that we did. You didn't go around and talk about weaknesses. If there was somebody who had some mental health issues, that was just uncle so-and-so or whomever, but it was never attributed to um, mental health. And so as a result of that, there's this huge, um, stigma around when you do seek help, that there's a weakness. Mm -hmm. And uh, none of us want to appear weak. You can do anything else, but not appear weak in front of someone. Mm -hmm. And until we remove that stigma that it's not about weakness, um, many, many people, brown, black, we have a huge Cape Verdean, huge Haitian population. It's such a ingrained, ingrained so much culturally that we don't venture outside of those bounds to seek help when we need to. And sometimes we don't give each other permission to do that when we need to as well. Very, very yeah. good answers. Someone else? Yes, this is Guan. Um, I'm gonna say, from my perspective, um, again, going back to growing up in the projects, um, the projects was like a huge family in of itself. And you know, we leaned on one another, um, families prayed together you went to your grandparent, you went to someone else's grandparent if you needed to, you leaned on the, you know, your, your neighbors and, and people in your community, you didn't go outside of that because 
people outside of that community couldn't be trusted. Um, and then again, growing up in the era of the 80s and even before that, you know, there was a lot and in, in wearing a trauma hat that I do, um, you dealt with a lot of sexual abuse within the families that was kept hushed and, and put under the rug and you couldn't shame the family. So talking about things that were traumatic for you and that's still bothering you, you can be shamed upon for bringing those things up or mentioning that your brother, uncle, cousin, whoever um, did certain things to you and grandma knew or mom knew, um, you know, it's, it's shameful. So a lot of people didn't want to or still don't want to bring those things up because they don't want to be shamed by the family. That is so true. We have another um, question from the audience, one of our registrants. So there is, where is it? Um, how do you take care of yourself mentally while having a career that helps other people with their own mental space? I'll go for, oh, mm. you wanna go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, mm. <laughs> Having your own therapist. <laughs> you have to have somebody that you can lean on, someone that you can talk to and put your stuff onto because you can't do it all. You can't hold it all. And we're human too. So we deal with a lot as well as everyone else. We have, we make mistakes. We have our own traumas and diagnosis. So we have to have an outlet ourselves. That's, that's it. Okay. I remember when I was in my master's program, Two things my, my, one of my uh, professors told us, that we weren't gonna make any money in this field and that we was gonna need our own therapist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying the first one's true, but that second one, like I literally did not become a good therapist until I became a good client. And I say that in all aspects because you can only be somebody's trash can for so long until you start to stink. Wow. No, see, I'm, I'm a product of, of the stigma in that I've never engaged with another therapist, which isn't to say that I shouldn't, but what, I, what helps me are just having really clear boundaries and striving for balance. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, that involves my faith, my spirituality, um, prayer. By, for me, the Bible and prayer play a huge role for me. And surrounding myself with safe people with whom I can talk to. And I spread it out because I always feel like I'm too much for any one person. So I spread out the things that I talk about. I have um, a, 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 a network of women in my life and that uh, are able to help me. But I do also, one of the things that's crucial in this work is having good supervision. And I've always really had someone, you need that person to be able to talk to so that you um, it don't keep it all inside. And I have another question for you guys. What steps are being taken in the mental health community to prevent, to prevent the increase in suicide and abuse rates in African-American community? I'll, I'll take this one. You know, one of my roles at um, the Cambridge Hospital is to serve as chair as, of our uh, diversity council. And as soon as I heard the rates uh, for black and brown communities being hit more with regard to COVID, um, I really thought it was important for us to figure out ways to make sure that people were not only taken care of physically, but also knowing how many family members were worrying about their loved ones, whether they were um, taken ill at home or being in the hospital. Um, and not only that, some of the most vulnerable people with regard to suicide are those uh, younger people who are in the LGBTQ community who are spending more time at home and probably showing aspects of themselves that they may have had hidden for reasons where they felt really physically vulnerable. And that population can often be um, quite vulnerable to suicide. So we're really doing outreach, um, not only to emergency rooms, but emer emergency support services and local police to do wellness checks on people that we haven't heard from, who we may suspect um, be in real danger of, of harming themselves or of being harmed by someone um, that, that they live with. Yes, I totally agree with that as well. And another question that is coming, which will be piggybacking this, as Massachusetts is reopening and other states have as well, there may be anxiety or apprehension that people may feel as a result 
And you guys know that that news that keeps coming on on CNN over and over again, it's causing a lot of anxiety for our audience today. What advice or encouragement can you offer relating to this? I would advise people to continue to have some sense of um, support, support system, use precautions, um, make your own decisions. Don't be so quick to run out and just because the state's opening to go back out and, and do things that you would have been doing previously. Um, continue to use your, utilize your support systems, your coping skills that you've developed throughout this time, and just be really smart about the decisions that you're making. Be safe um, and use precautions. I'd say, um, it's at least, I'm the wild one, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> to literally advocate for yourself. If you don't feel comfortable, say that. I mean, the, yes, Massachusetts is opening back up. We're all taking our precautions, we're all doing whatever, but if you do not feel comfortable, state that. I think it's also important to understand what your um, HR department's um, requirements are um, so that you can properly advocate for yourself, especially you may have health needs that actually prevent you from returning at, in the schedule that your office is expecting people to return. So, so be aware of those kinds of things. And then also remember that the person that you're in most control of is yourself. So you can take precautions in terms of wearing a mask or not. I mean, you, you can't control whether someone else is six feet from you, but you can control whether you are six from them. You can't control whether someone else wears a mask, but you can control for yourself. So I would say advocate, but don't focus so much on other people. Focus on what you can be empowered to do. Thank you so much. I, I was going to add to that. Um, Perfect. That, um, like um, Dr. Harris said, you can focus on what you can control, and we can control what we take in. And so there is a 24-7 news cycle. But you can, again, with the boundaries, mm -hmm. um, I can process something that comes on at four o'clock in the afternoon a lot better than I can at 11 o'clock right before I go to bed. You know, so taking the time to, to not inundate yourself, the news isn't gonna change that drastically the next day. And just having an all consume, I, I think having boundaries about how much you take in and when you take it in, not, not feeling like you have to consume everything all at once or continually. Planning breaks for yourself so that when, when you do go out or when, you, uh, when you're getting inundated with this stuff, you have a chance to step back and to breathe and to control those things around you as well. And that's great advice, Ms. Claudia, about creating boundaries for folks that are working from home because it's not always so easy to do that when working from home, especially if you have young children or if you have husbands, boyfriends around, and you're trying to focus and still trying to find time for yourself. Another question that came up was, over the course of the pandemic, we have seen frontline or essential staff experience mental health issues. We are defining frontline staff as all employees that have been going into work every day and not limited to only healthcare workers, but protective services, which we all know, police officers, firefighters, EMTs, cashiers, grocery store worker, et cetera. As frontline staff, as yourself, this pandemic is affecting you, right? What are some ways that frontline staff can manage the stress that comes with working during such a high demand time? And I can start. So I actually work on the front line and I can just start you guys off with the panelists since the pandemic started. And I feel like always having like a prioritization, having a plan in place as best as your ability to have that plan in place, um, that will really help you in managing what's going on in your life. It's always good to have therapists, friends, conversations, being able to vent. And even after most of the COVID deaths that I've seen, that really takes a mental hold on you because working in the emergency department is very fast paced. So do we have enough time to actually debrief? Not really, not necessarily. So that debriefing time comes when you go home and now you're upset and you don't really have someone to confide in. So for me, I do a lot of praying. 
Um, I, I make sure that I focus on what is at hand and I try not to keep my emotions at the facility where I work. Um, you, it's hard not to get wrapped up into that. You want to be someone's family member, but you still have to keep moving and keep a positive energy and a positive note. And I'm a pretty positive person for those who do know me. Um, and it's not hard for me to cope. And I have great coping skills and great coping mechanisms. You know, I'll hit that key or hit that note and sing for one second. And it de definitely helps me. So you guys have got to find what helps you out in um, coping. And that's what I would say to that question. Anybody else? Well, I, I think the other thing to recognize is that all of our frontline staff are potentially going through uh, long-term vicarious trauma. And so I agree with you, it's extremely important to give yourselves opportunities to allow those emotions to express themselves, whether they be confiding in someone. But I, but I would also say, make full use of your employee assistance program. They are reaching out to mental health professionals to say, I have this nurse, I have this police officer that just needs to be able to express what they've been um, seeing and going through. We are seeing more death. We are seeing more severe illness. We are seeing and hearing from family members who can't mourn the death of their family. Um, so you're seeing a lot. And because you have to keep it moving, you may not have the opportunity, even when you get home sometimes, to let some of that out. And we know that we all are vessels. And if that vessel gets too full and you don't let something out, that's when it will come out on its own. That's when you'll find yourself yelling. That's when you'll find yourself kind of exploding with emotions. So I highly recommend, whether it's in prayer, whether it's with a friend, whether it's through telehealth, give yourself some space to acknowledge what you're experiencing. I would, I would piggyback on what um, you said, um, Trinice, is that we are all dealing with so much anxiety. We, we can't even name it because we've never been through this before. And the only way we can get through anxiety is to get to a safe place to be able to debrief, to decompress. And I don't think many people find a, um, a safe space anywhere where you would normally have a, um, a, a routine of driving into work or being able to be away from others, all those things have been taken away in, in a sense. So you now, you now have to um, create for yourself spaces, safe spaces where you can decompress. And I know as moms especially, you feel like you have to continually, um, you've now turned into, um, you're, you're doing schooling, you're doing everything. You don't have those spaces that are naturally cut out anymore but maybe getting up 15 minutes earlier or going to bed just a, a meal or taking some time away from a television and sitting by yourself, giving yourself a chance to just relax and not be, I look for those times. I create those spaces. And I think the more of those things that you have to create right now for yourself, those little pockets of spaces will help you get through this. Thank you so much. I had a client tell me one time, have to get my checkup from the neck up. We have we have to take the the, the mental <laughs> aspect of COVID nineteen just as serious as the physical aspect. That's right. That's true. I, I also want to add that we have to allow ourselves and you know to recognize and validate that we're also grieving life. You know, pre COVID nineteen ourselves to, like Claudia said, be creative in ways of coping with this and, and managing life um, during COVID and, and after COVID. Um, accept the fact that life may not go back to the way that it used to be and try to plan ahead for what will life look like for me moving forward? What are the adjustments that I need to make, <clears throat> excuse me, for myself? And again, like everyone else said, limiting, you know, as how much news you're watching, how much exposure you're getting to what's going on, but stay in tune. You want to continue to have some sort of social out, out um, network and, and system around you that you can lean on and, and talk to people and still be connected socially with people because it's really important. As humans, we have to socialize. So just making sure that although you might be on the front lines, you might be isolated from your from your family. I have people, mm -hmm. clients who's reaching out for services, nurses who are saying, I have to come home because I have to isolate myself and my family, my kids are not even home when I get home. They're with X, Y, Z. Um, I feel so alone. And once I get home and the hustle and bustle of work is no longer, you know, going on, 
what am I supposed to do? You know, so just finding other ways to still connect with the outside world is important. I agree with that as well. And a theme that seems to be coming up with most of our audience is what are some tips on coping with seeing people who aren't wearing masks while so many people are dying from COVID-19? I would start with don't, don't judge. It's hard, but don't judge. Um, you know, one of the first, one of the most basic ways that people deal with stress is with denial. And a lot of what we're seeing with people walking around with no mask is people who are really um, in denial and really can't face that we are in a huge health crisis. And so I often just look at people and, and, and just acknowledge that this is someone that is having difficulty accepting this. But again, focus on what you can control because Absolutely. trying to engage them in dialogue about why they're wrong or why they should help them. So first year, you're also potentially putting yourself in danger. Um, you can, you know, protect yourself. You can figure out what your space is. Um, and if you're a spiritual person, pray for that person. Pray that they will not be so anxious that they, that they have to use denial. Pray that they will um, discern information well if they are listening to politicians instead of health professionals. Mm -hmm. um, do what you can do, but take your focus off of judging their actions. I second that. Agreed. And there's another question coming from our lovely can I, audience. Uh, Charlene, can I say something about okay. the math? Sorry. Um, okay. So I can speak on this specifically. I have a client who's agoraphobic. Yes. So literally a mask on her face is like end all be all for her. Yeah. So oh. therefore, like we don't know the circumstances why somebody is not wearing a mask. And we're just more so concerned of oh, PPE or whatever. I think that's the term. Is that the term? It is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are concerned about that and not realizing that people are like, that's life or death to some people. I, 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 would, I would agree with that because I've gone into stores and had a mask on. I felt like I was hyperventilating just because of the mask itself. And you can feel overheated. So you never really know where anybody is at. The only thing like um, Trinice is saying is that you can control your environment. And um, you don't use your mental energy. It takes... It takes so you know when when you have young kids you have to pack up the the um the crib you have to do all these things to get out of the house it takes so much mental Amen. energy now <laughs> with, with 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 COVID any simple task has just multiplied you can't just run to the store anymore you have to make sure you go at a time where the lines not wrapped around it and that you can go in and take use your mental energy for the things that benefit you don't waste it and somebody else. It, 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 it is too much that you have to put through your own mind to have to focus on something like that. Protect yourself. If you feel like somebody is coming into your space, I carry my little, um, my little bottle of um, Purell with me so I can make sure that I keep myself safe. If somebody doesn't look like they're doing what they need to do, that's on them. I, will, I can take care of me. Amen. But I have to say, I, I have to, I have to found myself having to take my own advice. I remember one of those first times going into Walmart and the someone put one of their items on the conveyor belt at the same time as mine. And I found my eyes giving them that mother stare, like, what are you doing? But then I said, Trinice, breathe, take a deep breath. But I had already given them the death stare, so they got the message. I decided to control myself instead of trying to control them with my eyes. Thank you, ladies. And just a reminder, a gentle reminder that everyone should be on mute so that we can hear the responses of our discussion leaders. I'm just going to step back to just explain what agoraphobia is, just so those that are not medical professionals and they want to know what it is. It's a fear of places and situations that may cause panic, helplessness, or embarrassment. And so those people can not really wear something as a mask for that. I do have another question that came from an audience member anonymously. And uh, it says, as someone who was able to transition very well to telehealth, what would be your suggestion for someone who didn't like telehealth or who aren't able to use telehealth for their mental health services at this time? That's a tough one. 
Um, I actually lost a couple of clients in the beginning because they did not want to transition. Um, so the best thing that I could offer them in that moment was to help them become adjusted, see whatever it was that I can do to make them feel more comfortable, whether it be walking them step by step through the process of, you know, um, getting online, making that process as easy for them as possible. Um, but that that's the best I could come up with because that's a really tough one. It's a real thing, but it's it's challenging, especially given a time like now. I still won't open my practice doors to have in-person sessions. Um, and that's for my own safety um, and medical issues as well as theirs, you know. So I try to do what I can do to make the process as easy for them. Um, and that and that's in any way I can offering to have someone else a family member is there someone else that can help you sign up or get registered. Um, what can I do. Can we talk on the phone. Can I, you know, walk you through the process. Maybe it's a couple of telephone um, sessions first and then try for them to get a comfortable with you and build some rapport <clears throat> before transition into video sessions. That's all I'm going to say because I can't talk. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it does, it does work. Um, there are a lot of psychiatric patients that I see in the emergency department who are also using like a telehealth form. We actually have iPads for all of our psychologists that are actually doing in-house. So they come, it comes on like a little, it looks like a little person. It's on a little screen and you get to talk to people. It might not be as comforting as one-on-one, but it is for the safety of um, the patient and also for the provider. I think it's um, also good to stress that with the clients feeling uncomfortable, the providers do too. Like it was, it was an adjustment for me seeing clients in my home. Like you see this picture behind me. I had a client like, oh, you got a tiger on your wall. It was like an invasion of privacy. So and no, no, like seriously, because I had clients like, oh, can you see this? Oh, I don't want you to see this. And I'm like, ditto. I don't want you to see that either. But you know, we have we have to make it do what it do sometimes. Yeah. I I have found surprisingly um that most people adjust. And I, I think what like what Guan was saying, you, you meet people where they're at and they may not be able to do a, a um a full hour session initially. They might just be able to do it for a little while and you help them build up almost a tolerance to it. I um you still get the same level of rapport in a lot of ways with them. And uh, I just think it's taking people where they're at if it's, if it's that phone call. But if you really need help, you'll reach out. You know, you'll, you'll take help in almost whatever format it comes in just because you, you have that much that you really need to get off of your chest. So we're just working with people to, to try and make that transition. And I honestly believe that Insurances have now opened up avenues that were not open to so many before, that telehealth has provided even more access. I don't, I don't think it's limited it. I think it's opened it up more that even out at network um, organizations are letting people see other people just because of COVID. So I think it's, it's given a lot more inroads and a lot more access for people in some ways. And I agree with that. I think the one area that um, that insurance doesn't cover is for those people who may have pay by you go phones or internet service that uh, some of them are avoiding using telehealth because they either don't have the bandwidth or, or frankly, they have a limited plan and that they want to, um, uh, they're prioritizing what they're using their cell phone and internet service for. Um, so I, I agree with all the comments before. I think that that's an area of disparity that we haven't yet figured out. Sounds good. There's another question. COVID-19 has flipped so many... COVID-19 has flipped so many people's worlds upside down. Many people have lost so much. Loved ones, routines, jobs. What are some ways to grieve? all that has been lost and still move forward? I think that this is an end of it, kind of an individual um, case by case situation in, in learning how to grieve because some people may already have previous um, skills to learn how to manage situations like this or so grieving process. This is, this is a re very difficult because even the way that they're managing uh, funerals and 
people in the hospital, you know, limiting family members being available and around during that time, people are dying alone. Um, and that's really tough for families. Um, and I think it's just an individual thing to see, you know, what best suit a particular client and, and helping them. Um, but if I had to say one thing, it, I guess it would be, you know, reaching out for support reach out for some support from someone that you trust, um, from a, a professional, a friend, anyone that can help you in, in, you know, through that grieving process, recognizing that you're grieving as well is really important. I would, I would agree with that. We're, we're going through something that we've never been through before. And uh, even as a provider, even though it's somebody who's done this for years, I, I was almost taken out one week just completely when I had three funerals in one week. And I think the, the hardest part of that for me was that one was at a Thursday at 1.30. It finished around 2, 2.30. And then it's like supposed to be life afterwards. Mm -hmm. Just everything, just go back into the same, go back to work. And there's not the natural, normal, not the um, grieving process of being with friends, receiving the hugs, um, anything like that. So if I had to compare, there was another funeral later that week that they created a ritual within that um, Zoom that was so helpful of lighting a candle and just having, so it, we're right now recreating how to grieve, how to, how to grieve, how to, to, to um, get an um, a iPad into somebody that you can't visit. We, we, we now have to figure out different ways of doing these things and also giving ourselves um, understanding that we might need to actually do the grieving later. That it, it's, not, it's not all finished right now, that yeah. you're just actually starting this process. And then when you feel safer, then, then, then you might get to a place where you can really feel that. But for the moment, you just almost have to just put a pin in it, do what you can for right now, and give yourself permission to grieve later or to have grieving over, over time, that it's not something that's gonna be finished right away. Understandable, thank you so much, Ms. Claudia. Uh, uh, one of the other questions, you guys can still be putting them in the chat. This is a kind of really, really good question. Like we were already talking about the 24 hour news cycle and how we need to decrease and limit the amount of time we're going on the news. We are constantly being surrounded by negative news, both COVID related and not like the death of Ahmaud Arbery. There have been statistical analysis that black and brown people are disproportionately dying due to COVID complications. All of this information takes a toll on one's mental well-being. What do you re recommend for dealing with the negativity that surrounds this pandemic about the black and the brown population? Y'all can take a minute. Recognize that that recognize the layers, right? That for us, it's not just a pandemic. It's a pandemic on top of racism. It's a pandemic on top of sexism. It's a pandemic on top of everything Trump says. It's it's layers. So I think it's really important first to acknowledge it, um, but also try to find ba find balance. You know, everything is not bad. There are blessings happening in our lives. And so I, I like to tell people to take a commercial break. Give yourself literally two minutes and two seconds to find something that you can feel grateful for. It can be the smallest thing, but as you add them up over time, it helps you create some aspect of balance. I'm not saying to ignore the other things because the more you try to act like those things aren't happening, they will push to find their way to express themselves but help yourself find balance in acknowledging those things that we continue to be blessed with, as well as those things that continue to uh, be traumatizing, frankly. I, I, I just wanted to say, I broke my own rule last night in terms of um, uh, balance with the news. I try not to watch the 11 o'clock news because it's too close to my bedtime. And I find that when I watch news at that time, I take it to sleep with me. And it invades all of my, all of my being all night. It, my dreams get affected. And last night as I watched um, the police officer with his, um, his foot on the neck of a, um, the black gentleman who, mm -hmm. who died, uh, it haunted me. 
it, it, and I, I agree with um, Trinice in that um, the layers, the, 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 I'm like, where's humanity in this? You know, and so it, it's so, it, it goes so much deeper. I have to make sure that I protect myself. That news will be there at eight o'clock in the morning. It'll be there at 10, it'll be at four. It'll be, I can access it at any time. I, I can't stop those things, but I can, I can absolutely put some boundaries and how much I, I don't want to take in more than a half hour to an hour of news a day. Those are just my own personal boundaries for myself. Um, because you take in too much, it will, it, it unbalances you when you have that much continually going in. So I just try to limit as much what I watch. Sounds good. And now uh, that, go ahead, you can have it. Elise. I think it's imperative to also stress for human. Yeah. So outside of all this, we're going to feel, we're going to be mad, we're going to be sad, we're going to be in an uproar and all that. And it's okay to feel that way. But I think it's also imperative that we stress to what extent are we feeling that way? Like, are we letting it encompass our whole life and our whole day? And is, are we letting it ruin everything around us? Or are we sitting in those feelings and then pressing forward? Yes. And now that more people are working from home, are there any patterns of substance abuse arising during this time? I'll speak on that, I guess. Um, Go ahead, <laughs> sis. <laughs> well, if you think um, social drinking, let me just throw that out there. What social drinking means to people? There is no limit now because you know, you go, go to work and you're like, oh, I can't wait to get off work. Long day, need a drink, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to leave work, go get a drink. There's none of that now because guess what? We're in the same place all day. So I'm going to log out my Zoom or I'm going to put my Zoom on mute or turn off my camera and I'm going to go have a drink at 10 o'clock in the morning. So I say all that to say a lot of people are increasing their intake. There, There is no social drinking anymore. There is pause drink pause drink or use or whatever so therefore there have been continuous relapse i have so many clients that have relapsed so many clients who are literally stressed out extremely because i don't have anything else to do guess what liquor stores were essential they stayed open when everything else was closed so what why do you the 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 sales at the liquor stores increased tenfold because those were the only stores that were open. So yes, it has increased, increased, <laughs> increased. I would like to add to that because I think it's important to say, I know you didn't, this wasn't part of the question, but with the increase of substance use, we also have an increase in domestic violence, a decrease in child abuse reports. And, but yet, and still, these are the same homes where people are using, they're drinking, and, and you know what I mean? So the rates of domestic violence are going up there's more calls all across the country and even in, even in other countries domestic um, violence has gone up significantly but the reports of child abuse have gone down which is really really scary really scary very i'm very glad scary. you mentioned that because i i think for for someone who sees children and families i think that some of the reason why uh, we have families who are not engaging in telehealth is because they're concerned about what we may actually see in looking into their homes. And we all want our privacy. I think that for families who are really, really struggling, um, and perhaps a, a parent who is truly, truly struggling with significant substance abuse or alcohol dependence, it may be harder to hide that in your home. And your child, when they're in that context with you, may be more likely to mention it in their home than they might when they're in the office with me. So I, I do agree with you that there has been, it's not that there's less abuse or less neglect occurring, that there are more actual boundaries in a lot of ways because there are less, um, um, there are less mandated uh, reporters. They're not going to school every day where their teacher can see how they're doing. They may only have a therapist who comes in through video or through phone once a week. Um, so we really have to be attentive to that. 
absolutely all of those outlets that would normally be available to children um, for reporting, they're all shut down right now. And kids are at home with their abusers all day long. So the access to be able to report and there's really, you know, limited access to be able to do that, especially with someone who's controlling what you do and how you do it. And now they're home frustrated. They're dealing with, you know, the way that the, the you know, society has shut down. Um, so they're taking that abuse out on their families more often. Shelters are closed mm -hmm. for families. So where where's the refuge? Where, where can these people go um, when they're stuck in a house with an abuser? I've seen some great um, things on social media where people were posting things like, comment in my inbox and say you want a wig if, if you need help or you know so they're being creative in how they're reaching out to people to um be able to get assistance and i've even seen people say if you're being abused say this in my inbox and i don't care we'll figure it out i'll help you out in any way that i can and i think that's great but i think is what if that person can't access social media what if they don't have the time to do that um there's a crisis line that you can text now i think that's great i think that's a great um avenue for people to use as well but it's really really challenging especially when you have liquor stores open yet schools are closed community centers are closed any access to you know people um mandated reporters are closed <laughs> yeah. yeah that it, it's very tough and i heard the reason why there was a question that came up and i seen it like the reason why liquor stores are open and considered essential and this is may not be the best um answer but there is a fear of withdrawals. So withdrawal syndrome, these people that are permanently alcoholics are gonna drink regardless, and they will drink Purell, and they'll drink anything. We need Purell right now for our hands. So they need to keep that open to prevent seizure activity, neurological issues. There's other things that are dependent on the liquor store. It's not for pleasure and for social ones that are going out and buying like three, three bags of jam jar and some beer. Am I talking about myself? I don't think so, I hope not. And so that's what it is, you know what I'm saying? But you know what right. else is open? You know what else is essential? Detox. That's good. Yeah. Perfect and detox, time. It is open and people come in and they want detox. We give them the numbers and hopefully it is the perfect time to get yourself together. It really is. It was a good time to um, be a part. It is 7.53 and I'm being really mindful of people's time. Um, I do have one question and a good question to leave you guys home with. Um, but the, the last question for our panel that I have listed here is, there have been news about reopening the nation's economy and some parts of our country have started to open up businesses in phases, which we know there are about four phases, I believe. What are conversations you hear coming up about adjustments to reopening the nation in our social lives in the wake of experiencing a lockdown? We're going to be living differently. So that was a question that came from one of our registrants to the panelists. I want to go back to the, the mention of agoraphobia and because I think there's a way in which we may have um, unintentionally created some mild agoraphobics. For two months we've told everyone it is dangerous to leave your house, stay at home, you're safer at home, safe at home. And now we want them to come out and come out now, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's important for us to really normalize that we may have some anxiety about reopening and not pathologizing it and calling it agoraphobia, but really in the mental health field, we would call it an adjustment difficulty. There's a real life stressor that is causing you some anxiety that you would expect to dissipate, to go away when that stressor goes away. So as we reopen, I think it's important for us to just, just say, yes, we're gonna be nervous about this. And to really create, um, you know, that's why we're doing phased ways. But I think we should have, you know, phased acceptance of the fact that we're going to be nervous. Those first couple of days at work, people are going to be irritable and touchy because you are too close to me. Yeah. Or, you know, I didn't want to be here anyway, right? So I think that it's important that we let that be part of just acknowledging that with one another. And I think it's also key to acknowledge the fact that we were never told that it's safe. We were told that the economy was suffering. So therefore, who's going to want to go to work knowing that it's still unsafe, but I have to go to work because you can't get unemployment because if you're able to work, you don't get paid. So it's not because it's safe, it's because of the economy. I, I, I would say again, for um, is that I absolutely agree with what's been said. 
we still don't know. We had this word asymptomatic and we don't know what it means. What does that look like for me? Am I asymptomatic? Is that person asymptomatic? So the only thing I can do is protect myself. So two months ago, three months ago, if you saw someone in Massachusetts or in the United States with a mask, you thought that something was wrong with them. Now it's a part of our culture. I would continue wearing my mask. I would do whatever it took to make myself feel safe. I would continue my Purell. I would, and, and know that you have to do what's okay for you and not what's okay for the economy. And, and it is a layered thing. You, you have to, to, to think about, can I now go visit my, um, my elderly mom and be okay? And there's anxiety around that. Can I hug? Can I? And we don't have any of those answers. And the speed of business is, is moving a lot faster than the speed of our, our anxiety. It's a moving a lot faster than us feeling and then our safety. And so all I can do is encourage people to put their own self-imposed safety around themselves because the, the government, business, economy, they're not looking at what you're struggling with individually and you have to take care of yourself and put your own boundaries around you. I agree with that. And I think that it's really important to be creative in how you set those boundaries for yourself, how you're able to generate income for yourself if that's your concern. But putting you and your family first is most important over any money or any business. Um, I saw a comment about down south being open. And if you look at the parts of down south that are open, predominantly um, communities of color, which I think is really, really sad. And these people are just running full throttle with it, back on the beaches, having party. And then our kids, our kids, these, these college kids and 17, 18 year olds having these house parties. And it's like, I mean, even adults, I've even seen adults on social media having parties, having, it's like, where's the sense of self-care for, for each other, you know, for self-care for, each, for ourselves and for each other. Where's the, where's the sense of like, let's, what do, our kids are living by example. They see what we're doing, so they think it's okay. And, and I think it's really sad. And then we wonder why the death tolls in the, in the black communities are, you know, so high. But it's like, we're the first ones to run out there and say, oh, outside's open, I'm going. I'm going. So I'm going to leave with that. But I think we have to pay, pay more attention to those sorts of things as well. 